Doc Middleton. Doc Middleton. Doc Middleton. Doc Middleton. Doc was born in 1851 in Texas, and he was born James Middleton Riley. Went by more than one name, apparently. I found him as David C. Middleton in Sheridan County. And it was changed somewhere along the way. He had many aliases. We don't have many records about him because he changed his name. They called him the local Robin Hood because he did not steal from the local people. He came from Texas as nobody. He had four or five different names. Why did they call him Doc? Some stories say that when he was on a cattle drive coming up from Texas, he fixed a cowboy's foot or that he helped the animals or, uh, or it may have been a name he gave himself. The story was he got his nickname Doc because he could doctor a brand to fit anything. If you are always looking like he did, it's pretty hard to change your identity. Is he a Riley? Is he a Middleton? He also was known as the Rob Roy of the Sand Hills. He was known as the King of the Horse Thieves, the unwickedest outlaw. Doc possessed a certain charisma. He was tall, handsome, had this big bushy black sideburn, his mustache beard that hung down to mid chest. He looks like a tough guy, but he looks like a straight up guy. He looks like he'll look you in the eye and treat you fairly and treat you man to man. Kind of had a somewhat dysfunctional upbringing. He didn't know who his father was. Some said it was his mother's brother-in-law. Other sources say it was a, a, a guy that was hung during that period of time whose name was Middleton. So, don't really know, but we do know that by age 14, he stole his first horse. There is a story about a young man named James Riley, teenage boy really, who'd come up with the cattle drives from Texas, ended up in Newton, Kansas, ended up being taken in by the local sheriff. The local sheriff was killed by a group of cowboys in the local bar, and he was avenged by this young teenage James Riley, who ended up killing the the men who'd killed his mentor. Might not be our doc, but I always wanted to believe it was. By age 18, he went to work on a cattle ranch and he signs on as a drover on the Chisholm Trail and things are going pretty good for him until they get to Sydney, Nebraska. Doc's at one of the local watering holes one evening and just minding his own business and this big old burly soldier came over and started harassing Doc. This guy is a lot bigger than Doc, and eventually started pounding on Doc. I mean, he got to the point where he was getting beat pretty bad, and it come down to where, you know, he, he was taken advantage of, and he had to do something, so he ended up shooting this soldier just to save his own life. He was able to escape, hop on a horse, get out of there. And he left the country at that time and came into the central Nebraska uh, to get away from out there because he thought for sure they were chasing him. In the next one and a half to two years, he seems to have gone on to enjoy the independent, free, maverick spirit of the Western man who rustles horses by the thousands, mainly from the Indians who were settled along the Niobrara River. In a two-year period, he stole anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 head of horses. Just remember, this country didn't have any trees on it. When they were moving, they were out in the open. And so you didn't just do it with one man and a string of horses. You took a herd of horses. Kid Wade and the Pony Boys were his underlings, so to speak. Doc Middleton's Pony Boys were the ones that helped him move his horses from one place to another. Doc always kept those guys under control. And they weren't all guys that were used to saying, yes, sir, to, to Doc. He wasn't, I don't think, a quick gun like Kid Wade, but uh, he knew what he was doing. Well, Kid Wade was very young and, and probably did not have a lot. Kid was kind of a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. Doc Middleton was much older and probably had 
a little more feeling for the local people. And I'm sure that that played a role in, in their relationship together. Uh, I think the whole story of his whole life is, is cool in this country uh, because he never become, uh, he was like a Robin Hood, he never become hated except for by the law. Uh, just sort of a natural guy. He would have a need to hide the horses because they're stolen. The sand hills are remote. There was not a lot of people passing through. You did not have law enforcement. As you go both directions, east or west from Valentine, there's a known campsite of his right next to a box canyon. You go south of Lynch is an area called Horse Thief Gulch, another area where they put the horses. Just southeast of Valentine is an area known as Robber's Roost. The robber's roost is more like a volcanic caldera or a bowl, and it is the highest point out there. So what they would do is they would drive the horses into this bowl or basin, and they could control them there, even though there weren't any fences, and they would be up high enough that they could then survey the countryside to see if the law was hot on their tail and they needed to move out fast, or they could just take it easy for a while but there were places where they could hide horses all along the Niagara River Valley. Even the local settlers were widely scattered, and so it was not too difficult to do that, and unless you had a horse that was branded, they wouldn't be recognized. If you had just a bay or a sorrel horse, he was just a horse and, and wasn't identified. If you're an outlaw, you have to have a certain sixth sense awareness about you because you're always having to look at your back. He stole horses from the Indians up in South Dakota. In fact, the Army had a warrant out for him because they, he was stealing ponies up at Fort Robinson. And then he would take those horses down to Kansas and sell them, steal horses in Kansas and bring them back and sell them to the local people. He would peddle them around the, the counties in Nebraska for not a lot of money. If he could make a little, he was happy, and it made the ranchers happy. So the people in that area weren't really against Doc and his group. Having hard cash in his hand, Doc Middleton could pay settlers and pioneers for lodging for he and his cohorts. If they came through with stolen horses, they could overnight there, maybe sleep in the barn, get a meal. Doc Middleton apparently took the time to befriend the folk of his territory, the Sand Hills regions. He appears to have gone out of his way to be sympathetic towards the settler, the pioneer, the families, and the men, and that developed his reputation as a Robin Hood kind of character. They called him the local Robin Hood because he did not steal from the local people. One story is that a woman with a small child needed milk, and uh, the next morning a fresh cow was found in her corral. Didn't know who the owner was, but that cow was there for her to milk. So the local people more or less uh, looked out after him. Um, he courted two girls from across the river, the Richardson daughters. And at that period of time, he marries Mary Richardson, and she was a young gal. And that's that period of time when they stole, you know, up to 3,000 head of horses. Stealing from the Indians in those days was no crime by white men's standards because Indians were very ill-regarded in that time. The Indians tried to steal their horses back on more than one occasion. Now that created some problems, obviously, because if you're stealing those horses from the Indians, the Indians then retaliate by stealing from the government and so you get this vicious cycle of all these horses being stolen. And of course, Doc gets blamed for all of it. At the time that Doc was stealing horses, there was no sheriff very close to enforce the law. The local people did uh, form a animal protection society. So the ranchers went to Pinkerton's and the governor, and they said, look, you gotta help us with this. They had wrangled his father-in-law to reveal his campsite. He and his wife and some of his cohorts were camped in a deep canyon in the sand hills of Nebraska, hiding away. 
And so they cooked up this scheme to offer him a pardon. If he would give himself up and then help them eliminate the livestock stealing. That pardon was just kind of a ruse in a sense. What they really wanted to do was capture him or shoot him. As this meeting was about to take place, there was a mishap and Doc gets shot in the belly, but does escape and within a few days later, he's captured. And tried for horse wrestling and convicted. And he served about three or four years in the penitentiary. He was a part of the ending era of the wild, wild west. And a lot had changed since he'd gone into prison. If you look at Nebraska, the northeast part of Nebraska was the last to be developed. It was an extremely lawless area. The country is becoming organized and law-abiding. It's not the open space that it used to be. When that changes and civilization comes along, with civilization you get law, order, and faster communication. The railroad was hugely responsible for the settlement of the West. Imagine, if you will, months of going across the Great Plains and in a matter of a year or two changing that to being days and the impact upon the westward move of civilization. Most of the outlaws either died young or they transitioned to a different way of life. They either had to transition into being the modern outlaw of the era or transition into doing something else as Doc Middleton did. Even when Doc was incarcerated, Kid kept up the outlaw horse thief image. Doc was in prison when Kid met his demise when they hung him from the whistling post down by Bassett. Which they did during the night, and the people that came on the railroad the next morning saw a frozen body hanging from the whistling post. Doc Middleton was very much a smart guy. He was a risk taker, but he was also one who always looked for the latest opportunity. And I'm sure he figured that if he was going to make his living as an outlaw, he would have to change from being a horse thief and a cattle thief to becoming a bank robber, becoming a train robber. Like Butch Cassidy changed from becoming a horse thief to becoming a train robber because he was able to see, well, that's where things are headed. When he got out of prison, he sees settlements, settlers, counties being organized, communities are growing, families are being built, churches are growing, and the whole society of the Sand Hills are becoming more law-abiding, more cultured. And a lot of the settlers probably don't share his belief that cattle rustling and stealing and gunfighting is an okay way of life. And so his time has passed. Most of Doc's conversion came about as a result of a prison stay. Given that that point in his life when the West was changing, he had also been changing in his life and decided it was time to do something else. Doc obviously couldn't be as successful trying to steal horses if we've got the telegraph and we've got other things that are going to be a hindrance to him. He was married when he was sent to the prison in Nebraska and his wife didn't wait for him but she remarried, didn't bother with a divorce. So Doc went calling on her, trying to find her. She was gone, she was remarried, and Doc took an interest in her younger sister. And lo and behold, they fell in love, they eloped, and he married her, which caused great anger with her father, and he gathered up her brothers and went looking for Doc to kill him. And fortunately, they didn't find him for a while until the anger had worn off and the new baby had started to show, so they changed their mind. Many of the pony boys are either dead, out of the country, gone. So not much left to pick up on. That time he spent in prison and then his subsequent second marriage had an impact on him because I don't know that he did any wrestling after that. So he decides to change his ways and tries to live on the right side of the law and actually served as a deputy sheriff for two years for Sheridan County. That kind of thing was possible in that West that was starting to vanish. Once civilization just takes over and it's necessary to become more civilized, Doc Middleton does that. As more people came into the country, Doc kept moving west, but he was always associated with either gambling or a saloon or something like that. 
So I think his spirit stayed the same inside him, and he found alternate ways to gain an income and live a life, still associating among those types of men. You know, Doc Middleton seemed to always stay one step ahead all of his life. A good businessman sees opportunities, goes after them, and takes risks. That's really the definition of a wrestler. Doc Middleton had a chance to do something that Billy the Kid did not. He had a chance to sort of redeem himself and become more of a respectable citizen as his life went on. He lived long enough that the transition of the horse to first the railroad and then the automobile obviously was going to put him out of business. He went from being a horse thief to a saloon manager. Doc had a certain entrepreneurship. He kind of transitioned into a better temperament and a better man. And he was successful. He had saloons in many towns. Well, if you want to learn about Doc Middleton, you've got to learn about the saloon culture. I mean, that was Doc's life from his early days, you know, being the patron to his later days, being the bartender and the owner. His last saloon was in Douglas, Wyoming. It's usually referred to as Doc's Blind Pig. And what they would often do is serve the alcohol through a curtain. And the person would walk into what was otherwise just a lunch counter and say, hey, I'd like whiskey or I'd like a beer. And if you asked the man behind the curtain, he'd put your money through and he'd give it to you. So that way, when the sheriff asked him, where did you get drunk today? They'd say, well, it was just down at the lunch counter. And who served it to you? Well, I have no idea, because behind the curtain was the blind pig. He knew that was wrong. He knew he could get in trouble, and he's trying to support a family. But there was still that little thing inside that, that was still spelled outlaw. But he still also wanted to try and be the good guy. Having been Mr. Lucky his whole life, he was, at the end of his life turned out very unlucky. He and his son had been running a bar just down the down the road in Orange Junction because there was a new railroad spur coming in and they turned out to be just an incredibly busy bar and in a time when Wyoming was just starting to require liquor licenses. Well, poor Doc Middleton and his son didn't have a liquor license and when uh, uh, one patron knifed another patron out behind his bar, he got the attention of the law and the sheriff arrested Doc Middleton not because of the knifing but because he didn't have a liquor license. Turns out the judge didn't want Doc to go to jail, he just fined him $200, but Doc couldn't pay it. So they put Doc in jail. Doc contracted erysipelas from his cellmate. Apparently that's a very infectious disease. It really brought his health down to the point where he had turned into pneumonia. Middleton was brought up to the pest house because of how sick he was. It's short for pestilence house, and it's a house where they would typically take people with infectious diseases to get them out of the community so they didn't affect more people than they had to. People in a pest house received a bare minimum of care. Usually a nurse or the physician would pop up periodically, but the people in the pest house were pretty much just left alone and on their own. It was the place to kind of get people out of sight and out of mind situated on a little bit of land, some horse pastures, some barns, just very close to the city of Douglas. It's kind of protected with these hills and this canyon that's in from the winds, close but still out in the country, so they could be kind of out of sight, out of mind. Stay one step ahead all of his life. You know, he was a, a poor kid from Texas uh, in post-Civil War Texas, a very depressed time. It just seems like there are story after story of him just escaping from one scrape to another scrape to another and always landing on his feet. That's why it seemed like such an irony that his life would end simply because he couldn't pay a fine. That was the tragedy that turned to just what a finable offense into a death sentence for him. You know, the bar fight that got him into trouble was in October. He faced charges in November. The court proceedings went on through early December. I believe he was put in jail about December 9th. And by December 17th, he was quite sick and in the pest house. And 10 days later, he was dead. The folks during this time were all great storytellers. Buffalo Bill, Wild Bill Hickok, Jim Bridger, all of them 
exaggerated things. They exaggerated the stories of their life. When Buffalo Bill created his Wild West, it was a new concept. He created an outdoor event that you could have the cowboys, the vaqueros, the Indians, the animals. Buffalo Bill's motivation was, okay, I'm showing this Wild West here. I've got the cowboys here riding up the street, coming right to the entrance of my Wild West show, having come all the way from the Wild West. The whole thousand mile race that ended up at Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was certainly a controversial thing, and the legends say that Doc Middleton cheated to win the race. Part of the way he put his horse on the railroad and won the race because he was ahead. Because that was Doc, why wouldn't he? You know, he was a horse thief, he was a wrestler, and he did what it took to win just like he always did. Buffalo Bill was probably pretty good to him because he declared him the winner and gave him the saddle. The legend grows and departs from the facts. Even the people who lived the true story and knew that the legend wasn't necessarily it were more than happy to be part of the legend. I think it was mostly people made up those legends, you know, you have to talk about somebody. You, you don't talk about your own family. So he was probably a, a good subject. A man that was questionable on their character, but he did some nice things for the local people. So he became a legend. Whenever you know someone, you have met someone, don't you brag about it? I knew Doc Middleton back in the day. For people who still had memories of him, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, would still remember him as a person. Not as a name in a history book, but him as a mythical person, an icon of the Old West. And I think they would have kept reading those stories and would have kept buying those newspapers and kept his legend alive. This era of the American West, of the Old West as we call it today, was a time that would become mythological in America's history because of the relationships that he developed, that also prolongs his memory, his legend. Thus, even though he's an outlaw, somehow or other, there is something noble in what he did. That outlaw image or that mentality is a part of all of us in that we all have a sense of adventure, excitement, innate in us. You know, we're kind of rooting for the, the outlaw guy in many cases. We all have within us that good and that bad impulse. And depending on the situation, we may follow it. And that's the fascination people have with the outlaws and lawmen of that time, because this is a mythical period in America. Doc was around for a long time. He started out a lot like Billy and Jesse with that dysfunctional early upbringing. Down the line, he's trying to make a go of it on the right side of the law. He lived to age 62 and died of natural causes. How many of those other guys did that? He didn't get shot in the back by Robert Ford. He didn't get gunned down by Pat Garrett. He died natural causes. That's what makes him unique, and I hope people remember that about Doc. Tree. You can't look ahead 